senators and two uh, representatives. Um, but I think this is obviously a, this is a one of our priorities, and I think it's an opportunity um, to, to write larger the conversation that we've been having at some tables around uh, a countywide CET on top of the bond, on top of all the other things that need mm -hmm. to be done. And... Uh, and the housing needs assessment. So the county is doing a housing needs assessment. The only thing that concerns me about this concept is that maybe a third of the people that will be there are from outside of Metro. So while the county CET would be something that they could use and would be uh, affected, would affect them, um, the Metro bond most certainly does not. So those are sort of pros and cons. One of the things that we have had discussions with groups about is that when people leave here, when they get pushed out of the rental market here, they're getting pushed to Malala, they're getting pushed to Esquita, they're getting pushed into communities without these services. So part of this is also an opportunity for us to talk as a region about the same families that are just getting displaced and figuring out whether or not there are better ways to make this all function. Right, and the mayors at least, um Mayors of uh, Canby and Estacada uh, and I have been in conversations around this issue uh, more regarding travel because of the travel shed that they are really part of, whether or not they're part of Metro, and that uh, the planning processes around travel mm -hmm. regarding housing needs to start incorporating. 
operating in both cities as well. So this kind of fits into the conversations that are already being had countywide. But. Yeah, it, it also kind of fits with um, the county's Economic Development Commission will be presenting to the Board of County Commissioners in just about three weeks our results for this year and kind of what we think the county should work on next year and um, under housing there are three or four areas one of them is ADUs one of them is CET and of course the you know utilization of the metro bond and the passage of the right. constitutional right. amendment so um, it certainly fits in with that also and provides good information thoughts Good either way. Yeah. I'm not invited. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I, I'm a more fundamentalist. <laughs> We're going to specifically have a bouncer at the door. <laughs> I could take a plus one, right? Yeah. <laughs> Back in. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. I was trying to think what if we had it the other way and we invited new legislators from Clackamas County. I'm not sure there's too many new ones, are there? Four. Four? Four. So, we're not, not new, 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 brand new, but there's Wagner, who is new. Rob, yeah. Uh, there's um, Rachel Prusak. Mm -hmm. There's Shamia Fagan. She was on the, she was yeah. a rap yeah. a couple of terms ago. Now, She's now right, a senator. Right. I've, yeah, I forget that would be considered uh, new. Um, the rep from, from Lake Oswego, Westland area, or uh, Lake Oswego area. Andrew? Andrea Salinas. Oh, so, yeah. Well, you know, she's been in there a while. They're not yeah. brand, brand new, but they're... Right. Yeah. I got you. You know, short session new. Two of them are short session new. One of them brand, brand new. Uh-huh. Um, it's the one that beat Julie Parrish? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I couldn't remember her name, so thank you. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's extraordinary. I look forward to you guys getting yeah, to know her. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my concern is the date change because I'm planning to not be here on January 31st. So oh, I do, and I learned from you last week. We have a location change too. I do wish we had discussed this earlier. All of these things, but um, I'm fine with that change. I just don't know if I'll be there. What is there a location change also? No, this. Yeah. Oh. No, so location Bob's. change. We, no Bob's. we don't get to use Bob's. We right. don't get to use Bob's. So we had to scramble and find something. Well, yeah, I wish we'd had a, more of a conversation around that. So where are we having it? We're not having it in the city. Harmony. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hurry up, Denny. Get that annex. Come on. I don't need Harmony. I need help with Kelly. No, I have no concerns. I think it's great. Um, it'll be happening what, right a few days after the, the, the new point in time count. And, so. mm. Talk about plenty, there, so, there will be plenty to talk about in the middle of July or January, I think. Yeah. So you would advocate for the housing version? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and another thought that just struck me, too, is that with the League of Cities Day at the Capitol the week before that, a lot of folks will have an opportunity to visit the legislators, new and old and whatever, and um, get to meet the ones they haven't met yet and hear from different people. So I imagine that some of those might be on their agenda for League of Cities. So, yeah. Yeah. And housing okay. is crucial. Yeah. yeah. And it's the topic of the day. All yeah. right. For and sure. also no concerns about the legislators. I think that's a great idea. Invite them as attendees. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's invite, I mean, unless it breaks the bank, let's invite as many of our Clackamas County legislators this weekend. Out of how many comments could? Because it's uh, $38? $38. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
might be important to invite. We always invite our metro. Right, but there will also be a new Washington County. Right, but Washington also a new president. president. You know, so. that wouldn't be maybe a bad idea. That's I mean, especially if we're going to be talking about working with Metro. Yeah, well, yeah. they'll be representing one too. So right. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, we don't have to pay for the legislators to enter. We can just invite them to come. We can have, if you guys are comfortable, we'll invite everybody. Um, but I wouldn't have time for us. Paying for it. Yeah. Legislators probably can't accept it and have be considered a gift. I don't know about that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's do housing. All right. So. Now we're perfect. Perfect. Hey. Lovely. <laughs> so we will uh, now we have the conversation with our planning Crush commissioner. Around. Lead it off, Denny. Yeah. Uh, this is the annual opportunity for the council and the planning commission to get together and talk about the commission work plan and any proposed changes to the work plan or the, uh, the commission's bylaws. Everybody got the staff report and it highlights a couple of things for uh, the coming year. I'll, I think there'll be a lot of work focused on the conference plan update. Um, we always try to schedule in the annual code maintenance piece, so at some point we'll probably want to bring together a new package of um, relatively small changes to uh, the, uh, something bite sized enough that we can accomplish it. Um, there are a couple of different housing projects that are ongoing right now, some grant-funded projects that could result in um, some planning commission review, the cottage cluster study, um, and the hillside manor master plan. Both of those will have some things that planning commission will have to focus on. Also, um, we have a number of development projects on the horizon that could take some time. The Bonaventure Senior Housing Project out on the, at the Turning Point Church site um, will be coming in soon. We're expecting that application maybe as soon as the end of the week. Um, the Transportation Demand Management um, Plan for the school district's um, uh, lighting of the ball fields, um, that one could actually be really complicated. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we've got a few other things out there that are that are coming forward, but those are a few that I know that uh, are going to chew up a bit of commission time. Um, the other thing that could occur at some point is some um, work on uh, tree protection for trees that um, would be on private property that interfere with development opportunities. So it's connecting tree protection with the land use component of the code that, that would require planning commission involvement. Um, individual tree um, permitting or something like that wouldn't necessarily be a land use function, but it, uh, when that collides with a development proposal, it becomes a, a land use issue. So. We'll see where that goes. But um, so I, I listed a couple of questions. You know, is the project list complete? Uh, are the priorities right, or do we need some different priorities? Um, are there changes to the bylaws that we ought to address? And then, are there some training opportunities that we ought to be recognizing as well? So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Chair Travis and see if she has anything okay. she wants to add, although she might not. Thanks, Denny. Um, I don't think I really have anything to add to his overview of of what we have coming up, but um, I'll just say that you know I think we're we're a pretty solid commission right now. We've had a lot going on, and um, and I think that we're uh, coming together as a group and and tackling some really tough things pretty well together. Um, we will miss um, Scott Jones, who's no longer on Planning Commission, but um, look forward to um, a new appointment at some point soon. So that's all I'll add. Thanks. So you guys all looked at the bylaws and didn't have any 
Okay. Changes. We changed them last year. Okay. No, we made some minor. I didn't, did we make changes last year? I think it was two years ago. Two years ago. They were, they were pretty minor changes. So I had uh, sent out a little email last last night, yes, sometime recently, a days ago. Uh, to the council. I think I CC'd you and Danny both. Um, as I was reading through the established purpose of the planning commission, uh, I was like, "Wow, this is seriously out of date." Um, and doesn't take does. It's the way it prioritizes would be very different than if we were writing it today, what it would prioritize. <clears throat> Particularly in light of uh, the, the vision that we passed two years ago, a year ago. The light of uh, what? Oh, vision. The vision. <clears throat> and, and more recently, the climate action plan. Um, this uh, has all kinds of priority. You know, there's this much in the purpose about protecting historical uh, properties as if we have the, you know, the Egyptian pyramids or we have Machu Picchu or we have some seriously important historical thing here that's like half of the priorities of the Planning Commission and zero mention of climate change, zero mention of, of any of the other things that we're needing to address as we try and move towards the, the vision that, that we've established for the city. Um, we've got things in there about harbor shipping and transportation facilities. <laughs> I don't know that Milwaukee has ever had harbor shipping and transportation oh, yeah. facilities, yeah. but oh, yeah. if it has, yeah. it hasn't been in this century. <laughs> well, that's true. Um, you know, so, you know. Uh, there is uh, solar and wind. Solar and wind. There's a, a sentence in here that talks about um, to secure to the city and its inhabitants sanitation, proper, proper service of uh, public utilities and telecommunications utilities, including appropriate public incentives for overall energy conservation. Um, nothing about internet access or fiber. Um, well, is that even appropriately planning permission? Well, yeah. it's a great question. Yeah. And that's my point, that this is... I think significantly out of date. Um, I think I think there's a lot of opportunity in this to bring the purpose of the planning commission in line with where the city is trying to go. So I don't know on a staff level. I'm sure this is like oh god, more things that we have to do. But by the same token, you know, the committees and the commissions do the things that our code tells them they need to do. And if our code is telling them to worry about things that are 50th priority and to not worry about things that are first priority, then the code's broken. I had a conversation with um, Justin, our attorney, just to see what kind of capacity he has. He is Is there anything going on in the comp plan work that would better? Would it be better to, to be do it after put the, after the comp plan? I guess yeah, would be my question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's not like we're off doing things that aren't like right in the, the in the area where we're supposed to be working. You know, if some of sure. this was sending us off in areas that didn't make sense, that would be one thing. Um, and I, I just wanted to point out about the historic preservation piece, that, I mean, it wasn't here, but that ended up, I'm sure that ended up in the Planning Commission section once the DLC um, was removed, was made a committee rather than a commission. Because at one point, they had all that decision-making authority, and I don't know what year it was, but it was taken away and given to the Planning Commission, and they were made an advisory committee 
essentially to the Planning Commission for historic review. So those points, I'm sure, were all listed very clearly under the DLC at one point. Uh, and I don't have any yeah. big beef with uh, I, the I, I historical work. The point I'm making yeah. is relatively, yes, com you know, compared to affordable housing, compared to, you know, preparing a city to meet the challenges of climate change, it's a pretty low priority. It was, it was and, probably and one yet bullet, it though. takes up, yeah. yeah, it takes up half of your purpose. Um, so I guess my only concern uh, around waiting until uh, for a year and whatever it would be, a year and a half, two years before we did this, is we are going to be seeing projects between now and then where a different perspective on the purpose of the commission could shift to some degree the way we address those projects when they come before the commission. And I'm thinking specifically about um, Hillside. So at some point, Hillside, and, and not in the terribly distant future, right, because there is $653 million sitting out there waiting to be spent that has to be spent pretty quickly. Um, and I intend for a good portion of that to be spent in Milwaukee. And I think the opportunity that we have with 16 acres, given our vision and given where we're trying to take this town, there's an opportunity to create sort of that perfect neighborhood. This is what a city could look like. But, but <clears throat> didn't they do what, that? What about this? I, I mean, yeah, I don't see, I guess, what about this impedes that It doesn't impede it. I just, I, I want to make sure, well, it's two things. One, I want to make sure that it's informed, that all, all of the conversations going forward, everything that we do, the decisions that we're making, are made through the lens of, does it make this city more equitable? Does it make this city more sustainable? Does it make this city more livable? And you guys make a lot of decisions that are that don't come to us unless somebody has a problem with your decision. So I think it's I think it's important that that is baked into the way you're thinking about things. Um, there is an, a second piece. What else did you say? I just asked what, what about the impedes impedes, impedes the, yeah. their work on hillside. It. it doesn't per se, it just doesn't inf necessarily inform it. it. It gives the impression, I mean, I agree with the mayor, if you read this, it gives the impression, especially the section on historic preservation, mm -hmm. which Denny, you're probably right, it, it went to the Planning Commission, and so they added this bunch of stuff here. And it, when I went to ORS 227, this, this is the same language in the state statute, so it's, it was like a cut and paste. Oh, and the, really? The state statute says cities can create planning commissions and they can do these things. And it's this. Mm -hmm. So there hasn't been probably a lot of thought given to it when it was put in our code. Mm -hmm. And I think we could update it and, and, you know, um, and address some of the livability and uh, sustainability, climate action issues that the mayor's talking about. But this looked to me like it was a cut and paste from ORS 227. And I love the check. <laughs> I had to know what it, you know, it says in here. And other things according to ORS 227. <laughs> well, I tried to check on the... DLC move, and I couldn't find our ordinances on that. Um, but anyway. So, well, and so I remember what the second piece was. We won't always be here, right? It won't always be this planning commission, it won't always be this council. I have every confidence that this planning commission, this council, will be working towards that vision in six years, in eight years, it could be a brand new group of people. And I want to make sure that their purpose is clear. So maybe it can wait two years, and we can just all be cognizant. But uh, I'm only sort of saying this jokingly, but as someone who's recently said, it's not before our planning commission, uh, they are looking I 
that's why I drove tonight. <laughs> I, I beat myself every day. <laughs> I would also like to make a suggestion because what happens is that if it's not a land use, you know, it doesn't come in front of us. So, for example, we haven't seen a climate action plan, nor have we been discussed with it about. So, um, I think as the city starts to set their uh, priorities and comes up with these plans, even if they're not land use, but yet they will kind of help guide some land use, um, that the uh, city, city should maybe take some time out of our meeting to come and uh, at least talk about what these are and how to look them up. As an active citizen, I'm, in, I'm involved with this stuff, and you know I believe with 90% of the direction that you guys want to go. So. You know, I think that those priorities are important, but we're just uneducated on it. And before everybody gets too excited about nodding heads, uh, we also are changing the way we go out to boards and commissions so that there's a singular place where we're taking projects. What we are planning on doing is making sure that we get information out that says this committee is working on this project. Please send a representative if you think your committee is going to be interested. Because I agree with you. Um, we're producing a lot of documents right now that are guiding and binding documents, and they're really helpful for everybody to know. Staff's getting through most of them right now, reading through them. Um, but we're running out of time uh, just to make sure that we're getting to every location. Did you well, I mean, what you talked about is is when you're working on something, the send your person. But now that it's done, the climate action plan, it does seem like 30 or 45 minutes on a on a commission agenda to just kind of hit the high points would be a good use of time. Did you guys do that with the vision? Did, the, vision? did the, yeah. the entire... Yeah. Yeah. But they were also instrumental in the creation of the Sure, vision. yeah. Yeah, that would have been good. We can, uh, we can certainly schedule that now and try to get uh, um, Peter to come and give an overview or or Natalie could do it or, or your yeah. sustainable yeah. director <laughs> <laughs> I would just add the other uh, thing that we've talked about is goal one and how um, through the update of the comp plan um, that might look different or there might be different um, ways that we um, the Planning Commission is more actively involved yeah, around goal one and so I think you know I guess the it's the tension of how much time do you put in now versus waiting until we have For the benefit of people that aren't clear on organs. oh sorry goals. goal one citizen involvement public involvement um, is goal one for Oregon's land use laws so um, there are different ways that we've talked about about um, addressing that goal and so some of it might come in to here into yeah. the planning commission yeah. that's a good point yeah yeah so I, I think that I, th I think it's something that needs doing I could be talked out of it needs doing quickly. <laughs> right now Natalie's working on her engagement plan for both businesses we're going to be working for the next six months of priority for what she's trying to get through. Um, we'll add it to the list, but I, just as a reminder, any time that that becomes a stumbling block around decision making, I hear what you're saying, conservation, but this is the decision making point. This is information. That's what you're So thanks. Can I? Uh Follow up, Denny, to what you said regarding the tree issue on private property and development. I'm not familiar with what or what, what do you could you elaborate on that? I guess is the question. What do you mean? Well, if if um, we end up looking at some tree protection, if there is an impact on the pattern of development as part of that tree protection, that would make it a land use related code. So we need to then go through the planning commission at, for any kind of hearing or review, and then go to the the council for final approval of that. So, so for example, if certain if we passed code language that prohibited certain things being done to trees on land, then you would say that that or you're saying that that potentially yeah, that inhibit be, the development. That would, it would be a land if if the city were to adopt some sort of tree protection ordinance 
that was beyond cutting an individual tree, that something that would have some impact on development that makes it a land use code provision that would have to go through the Planning Commission for a hearing for that ordinance before it would go to council. So, so um, if, for example, and I, Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, because it's been a while since I've been to a tree board meeting, but the, if, the tr if the tree protection code says that um, you can't remove more than X percent of your canopy on a given piece of property, right? We all experienced what happened at King Road. Mm -hmm. There were whatever, 212 trees there, and they're like, oh, we have to cut them all down to build these houses that were required to build by minimum density and minimum lot sizes, right? That all of a sudden is a land use question. So if, if, we've, if our tree code has uh, created this dynamic where you couldn't possibly both protect all those trees and comply with, and comply and with the, the minimum density, density and the minimum lot size. Uh, I mean, we have provisions for that. We have in natural rules section. in the natural resources. So I, I think that might be the way that we eventually get there. But that's why all of a sudden it's a land use question. And is so, that where the tree code is roughly aiming? Well, I mean, we've been holding a series of workshops with the planning, or not that, with the planning department to sort of discuss sort of what that framework of uh, tree code looks like related to to development for protection and preservation on, uh, on property. Uh, and, and we're looking at doing some, some case studies to sort of gain those different options of how we set that up. So, you know, we're sort of having the, that that discussion right now. We had two workshops, I think it was last, was it last week or the week before, uh, before. with the planning uh, department. And we're planning on having several more uh, meetings to do that, just sort of refine that and see, you know, what are the consequences of these different decisions looking at uh, previous development? What would that have meant for those developments if you put things in place like that? But either way, if we, if we go forward with something, it's got to get through the Planning Commission before it gets to Council. So that was the, the main point I was making, is that depending on how, how quickly the tree board proposes something, where, where you guys are on advancing that, where the city manager is on managing all of our time, those are all factors in there, but it could end up, there could be something that ends up at the Planning Commission. I've given up on that, Denny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm actually scheduled to come to the council, I think, December 4th to talk about the tree boards over the course. Like, sort of outline, that outlines the, pol the, uh, the goals and the policies, the proposed policies and actions that will then sort of provide that further direction towards updates of the tree code. And, and if we included heritage trees, it may involve the DLC, who you get right. to talk with next. Right. right. Okay. Housing is going to be a big one for us over the next year. It's yeah. going to be huge. Yeah. yeah. We are all going to be buried. Can I ask, um, I don't know, maybe you don't have anything to say about this, or maybe you do, or maybe you want to wait and hear, but in the package that we got from the DLC, they suggested that they um, become a commission again, that they change roles and not be an advisory committee to the Planning Commission. Do you guys have a view on that? Are there... Um, I don't think they've heard it before. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, okay. <laughs> this is new information. <laughs> okay, well, fair enough. Then, it's, then I won't put you on the spot. And, and we definitely don't have enough information right. yet to and be making a decision on that tonight. I'll, I'll chime that in as an old-timer to yeah. the city because, I, um, what was it, 2007 when the DLC got? D well, as far as I could tell from the ordinances, it was 2004. It, it was like. 2004. So um, now if... Uh, if you want to put somebody in uh, in charge of 
uh, heritage trees or qualifying a heritage tree or qualifying a historic building for a sign or whatever, um, it would be really convenient to have the DLC as, you know, design and landmark to be able to have the capacity to do that without having to go through, then going through the planning commission, then going through city council, if you could just, you know, give them the right to that. And I guess that would actually make them a commission because they'd be holding a public hearing. Um, you know, the rest of their charges, you know, design review for uh, downtown, and they're working on a program right now that basically kind of creates a standard and gets rid of the language of, you know, the, uh, you know, within character of Milwaukee, what in character of Milwaukee, whatever, right, that means, right? And so uh, if they create good language, and I think that they've been a responsible uh, committee, I know that most of us planning commissioners come from the DLC and we take great pride in their decision-making skills that, um, yeah, it'd be nice if we were to, like the old days when the uh, DLC would come before the planning commission and just kind of give their over review of a, a design and this is why we said what we did um, without having the planning commission to spend that amount of time on that it would be I think it would be a great thing do you, if they do you the design on the DLC I back was not on the was no I started when the light rail thing came in so yeah. whenever that was do you Greg or anyone anyone know why it, it was I don't want to say downgraded, but <laughs> it's downgraded. In the first place, I, I, I believe that there was just discussion that uh, that the planning commission would be better suited for as an oversight role. Were you on the planning I commission? I was a brand then? new planning commission. I'll tell. I, I mean, and I the won't. decision was kind of you know. I, that's why I, I mean, before we would yeah. ever have any you know really serious discussion about that, I would want to see all those old staff reports from that yeah. period. I was brand new to the planning commission, and I didn't really have any, you know. I've heard rumors, but it's nothing that I want to say on the microphone to, in the public <laughs> record. Okay. Wow. Um, I do think it went on. It was a discussion that went on several over some period of time, over a year or something. So I think there were probably multiple <coughs> meetings on it. Hmm. Chair Bernard was also on council at the time. Yeah. There might not have been a lot of development, downtown development, um, at that point either. Well, there so was one before. of the concerns that occurred to me is, um, say you've got a design element like in in a big project, and and DLC makes a decision on a design element, but then it comes to you if they if they're separate, and then it comes to you, and you have to make various variance decisions and other things that then may affect that design element decision. And so then does it have to go back to them? And how does that mess with the 120-day clock? And, I mean, it seems like there could be some, mm. you know, some problematic. There are other there. models. There are different communities that handle it all in different ways. Yeah, so. Is it common to have a um, DLC? A Design and Landmark Commission in other communities? Or is it more of a committee? Or how does it work in your well, experience? In in Oregon, well, I'm going to, it was a long time ago when I worked in Oregon City, but Oregon City had a historic landmarks commit commission that dealt with all of the historic review aspects. It didn't deal with um, commercial design review, for example, in the newer part of Oregon City. But they had you know, commission authority, if you appealed from that commission, it went to the council, went to, which is the city commission mm -hmm. there. Um, in Lake Oswego, um, there was a, a design review commission and a planning commission. Planning commission was almost strictly policy advisory to the council, mm -hmm. and, and all of the development review work went through the DRC that their decisions were then appealable to the council. Now and then you would have a project that required both planning commission and DRC review. But it was, it was, I think, I think there was the ability at that point to merge the authority into one group if you wanted to do that. For uh, project specific, you mean? Or I'm what? sorry. Merge it for merge it as a like have it have the 
have the uh, DRC um, do the uh, review of a, of a zone change, for example, I think that could happen. Mm -hmm. If the zone change was separate from a development application, it would go to planning commission. But if it was connected to a development application, it could be done by the um, DRC. Okay. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of models out there. Do we have everyone in the room who's planning on joining us for the DLC conversation already? Because I just, I worry about having this conversation too twice. Because <laughs> well, we're getting into DLC now. Well, come on. Uh, do we have enough? Yeah, we can squeeze in. There's Why chairs over there. DLC folks, come on out. Let's have this conversation for... probably has about 10 more minutes before they need to take off okay. to get to City Hall for the 6.30 hearing, which we will probably start a few minutes late so they don't have indigestion. Okay. Are there other items that Planning Commission wanted to talk about? Yeah, did, did Planning Commission finish everything you guys wanted to talk about other, other than outside of this? T talking about we um, according to the bylaws we um, appoint a new a vote on a new chair annually so that will be happening early in 2019 um, what I was referring to was meeting with the land use oh sorry okay yes chair. okay that that chairs okay and the other part and it is in the staff report but we um, suggested that um, along with goal one citizen involvement public involvement that we would um, directly engage with the NDA land use chairs at some point um, or hopefully early in 2019 to just talk about how things are currently working with communication and timing and you know and them um, being able to weigh in um, on recommendations to planning commission so I just wanted to alert you to that proactive engagement that we're seeking there I think that's a great idea yeah. Yeah. maybe we'll light a fire get a little more enthusiasm from the land use chairs all right well then let's continue this conversation about the the other thing I might note is I know that the, the first hearing item, and we might maybe we'll switch the order, but the first hearing item before the commission is one that the, um, the DLC is interested in because it's the remodel of City Hall. Uh -huh. So they, they also may want to get out of here. Time to <laughs> but anyway, with that. Do you have flexibility to flip your agenda? I was thinking we probably do. You know, we could, we could, um, yeah, we I'd could like do that. Here. Yeah, we'll okay. give you time. Yeah. It's only somebody else's department's comp time. Um, <laughs> it'll work out. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Lauren, what, give us, tell us a little bit more about your thoughts on on the DLC becoming a commission piece. Yeah. So <clears throat> the, I think it's a discussion that the DLC has been kind of interested and eager to have is, um, you know, the idea that we might, it, currently as it works, we provide recommendations to the planning commission. And I think, you know, uh, back when significant changes were made to the code and there was a lot of interest in trying to clarify and make easier the path for development in the city, a lot of things were done to kind of turn back the dial and make it uh, an easy, clear process. Um, and, and kind of in the same vein, I think, the interest is can we make this process of design review even easier or more clear? 
um, is it possible to uh, reduce the amount of presentations that a, any given applicant has to make, the number of bodies they have to, um, uh, commissions or bodies that they have to then um, present to and get approval of. And I think currently the process of going through the DLC um, we provide recommendations, as I said, so any kind of conversation or any recommendations that we make or comments that we make on any given project, um, they are, it's at the, uh, the, the planning commission can either decide that they uh, agree or disagree or, or that they're interested in talking about it or not interested in talking about it, and it, it goes every different way. But I think as an applicant and someone who's been on that side of the table before, the process is not clear. So if something might be a primary interest to any one of the DLC members and tends, you know, becomes a hot spot during the presentation, it may or may not be a hot spot for the planning commission. Or um, And so I think there's a lack of clarity there in, in the way that we review projects. and. Um, it could be simplified. We could have better use of both our times uh, between the DLC and the Planning Commission. Um, and so I think there's just interest in talking about how we might revamp that process. And as you say, is there's a lot, you know, is there's a lot more development coming in, particularly now with affordable housing. Um, I think both um, the uh, PC and the DLC are going to get very busy. And so how can we use our time wisely so that we can get as much coverage as possible? Right now, the, you know, the DLC, um, we spend a lot of our uh, time as any given project comes in. I'm sure the Planning Commission, too. You know, the time that we have to review projects takes up the time from our work session items that we want to get to eventually. And so um, the DLC ends up spending, you know, in the chair, the uh, co-chair, they end up attending both meetings. So they'll attend the Planning Commission meetings so that uh, all of the recommendations are there. We can answer questions because it's important to us. We want to make sure that we're there to voice that. And then, you know, obviously we see the full presentation from the applicant at the time that they sit in front of the DLC too. So I just, I think it would be very efficient for us. I think there's a lot of energy right now and a lot of potential with development. And I think you know, I wonder also if the question of um, reducing it from a commission to a committee was because of interest. You know, it, uh, as a commission, then it's a lot more important who you have uh, on your team who's reviewing projects and what their experience is and experience level and interest is and commitment because you're a commission now and you're, you know, have real authority. Maybe, you know, others might want to add on. Well, that's that's pretty much what we've been talking about. I think, I think the the lack of clarity if, on what we were supposed to be reviewing. We had this sort of guideline, and then we have the standards. And so, sometimes it was just a little like loosey goosey for us. And so, um, you know, obviously the standards are the standards, and we can talk about those. But when it came to the guidelines, it was just really hard for us to try and you know, make recommendations to the Planning Commission that we're adding a meet to them. So that's why I like the idea of kind of combining all that now into one sort of design standard document where it'll be codified. We're really excited about that. I think that'll make it easier too. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's been our thoughts. So Could I add one more thing? Yeah. One other thing that we talked about that we just barely touched on is like <coughs> if, if this were to occur, how would variances be reviewed? So like that, you know, that's 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 something that takes more discussion, quite a bit more discussion. But would that, you know, if you were to make the DLC a commission, would they review variances? Well, that's what I was just going to ask. So uh, in, in the, the what we're the path we're going on? No. Well, uh, for the first question I wanted to ask was um, <clears throat> both what we've experienced in the past and what you can kind of see coming down the line. Do you imagine that there will be a number of hearings that are simply or, or solely, I guess, uh, about design standards that don't also require some other land use variance to where it could be being split off, right? To where it, that ended up not having to come to Planning Commission if there was, if the Design Landmarks Commission, you know. Well, what the way what we're working towards right now, and I, it's it's a horribly slow process, but I think we're 
we're getting it, we're really coming up with some good ideas, um, is to have the set of standards and then a set of guidelines that are really an alternative path to meet the purpose that the standards achieve. So you wouldn't need a variance. If you can't meet the standard, you don't go to the variance route. You go to the alternative path, which is the guideline route. So that would be something that clearly could be set forth that a, that a, a, a design commission could address. It's when you pull out of that and address some of the, um, there might be another set of standards that uh, uh, would require a variance. That's well, that's where I was going, was, yeah. you know, uh, well, building like, projects that both have a, a design variance and then have a stormwater right. variance or a Driveway setbacks access, variance. Or, or a drive, yeah. Yes. And, and like they have done in Lake Oswego, when there are those types of things, in Lake Oswego, you've got the ability to collapse them into one body. So it's how much power do you want to give a commission, you know, a design commission versus a, a planning commission. That's the, you, you got to maintain two active commissions that have the potential to hold hearings, make decisions, and do all of that work. So it's, it's a different kind of animal, you know, it does require a lot of staff support. Yeah, and I, where do you guys currently hold your meetings? Uh, at City Hall. So when you have a hearing, a, a presentation from a developer, it's in the council chambers, just like... Correct, yep. So that, I was thinking about scheduling issues. Yeah. <laughs> That's the same anyway. And how, how often do you meet? How often? Uh, well, right now, we're, we're ramping up. We're, every two weeks we meet for two, two and a half hours mm -hmm. um, because we're trying to get through our material. <clears throat> but we've also been pretty busy on the design review process. So we've got applicants that are coming back a number of different times and that's, that's, that's time intensive. And so I'd say that's half of our time right now is being held up by, not held up, that's our purpose, that's important, but by design review applicants. So, so Mayor? It's 6.14. Okay. Uh, I think planning commissioners probably need to go. I think we, we need, need to, to have additional conversations. Uh, a couple of the staff people I would like to also have engaged in this conversation, Alma Flores and a few others who are working on specific designs to give us some insight for what they think might come through this process. Sure. There's some fear about the duplication of process, um, and I think that that's probably what happened before, but I'd like to do some more research on that. Well, it almost feels like there's duplication now, in that right. right. an applicant has to come to the DLC, and then they have to basically bring the same game to the Planning Commission with just the recommendations, whereas if they were only doing design, they just had one. And yeah, I, my, I don't know, my sense is that from nine years on the Planning Commission, it's almost never just, just design. Just one, yeah. It's almost never just design. There's always, you know, setbacks or driveway spacing or something, you know. Which indicates to me that there might be something wrong with our code. <laughs> no way. No, that's impossible. <laughs> the code. the code's perfect. Every application. Okay. Well, thank, you thank you very much and have thank a great you. meeting. Thank you. And we'll try and cut them loose soon enough that they can make it to uh, their interest. Thank you, Scott. You do an excellent job with those things. You're awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, since you kind of it, this all happened weird, um, do you guys want to? Brett doesn't want to sit over there by himself. You feel lonely over there. <laughs> I was going to come join you. <laughs> um, do we? You're free to stay, or maybe just so that we're not. You want to go over there so that we're not doing this? Your head already hurts.
apologize for turning back up. No, I, 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 I don't feel well, so my oh, head I'm hurts. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. I got some kind of bug. So, let's pretend we're starting from scratch. Hello, designer landmarks. <laughs> I guess Lauren might have a copy of our draft work program um, in front of us. And I think we want to just touch base uh, on a couple of the key points with that. And then we've obviously kind of broached the subject, one of the discussion subjects. There was some interest in getting some feedback on. I think there's another point about a couple of the central Milwaukee sites. There's a little bit of curiosity in talking with you guys about that. Um, I guess by way of quick summary, and then I'll invite you and any of you you guys to weigh in. Um, as Lauren mentioned, I mean the the key effort the committee has been making over the past year plus, and uh, as she noted, has been ramping up its efforts is focused on trying to renovate the design review process. So what started as a project to update the photos in the downtown design <laughs> guidelines turned into editing the text and then finally evolved into full-blown um, trying to really, we, you know, taking apart the lawnmower and trying to figure out how to put it back together in a way that, um, that makes more sense. And, and so the group has committed to um, to following through on that effort, which is why they've been the last several months meeting every couple of weeks, trying to slip in extra sessions, um, and why we were, we were able to do some good work with a consultant that we're trying to, to, to push forward now. So that's been the focus of, of the group's efforts. It obviously is also responsible for other review issues as they come forward, which the group has no control over. Um, when there's a project that needs design review or historic review, um, as has been noted, that you know, that gets put onto the group's agenda, and they, they pick those up. Um, but the primary focus um, for the coming year, I think there's a, a, a high level of interest in trying to um, come to some conclusion, uh, well, an initial conclusion in the draft process with the design review, um, the design review standards and guidelines. Uh, we have uh, one of the planning commissioners, Joseph Edge, has been serving kind of as a liaison from the planning commission. He's been participating in those meetings so that the planning commission has some idea of what the discussion is, has been. And um, when we get far enough down the road, I think there'd obviously be some work sessions, both of the planning commission and the city council, so that there could be a little bit broader conversation about where things are going with uh, the proposed process um, so that uh, it'll all fit together well. So they're, they're look, you're looking at not just what we call the old standards book, or the old guidelines book, but also changing the design standards that we did in moving forward in Milwaukee? Yeah, not, and not necessarily fully changing the standards, but, but I think kind of like what we have with uh, the design review for multifamily housing, it's all in the code. There's a clear and objective standards focus track and uh, if you can't meet the standards within the code, there are guidelines and so it's all in the code and so the, I think the idea is trying to pull the downtown design guidelines into the code as well. So that, so that the, um, what started is trying to see if, if the guidelines matched with the standards as the conversation continued to start to seem like it would be it just makes more sense if everything can kind of get pulled together so you can see what's, you know, how, how if you do end up in a more discretionary review process and you're focused on guidelines, you can see the connection to the standards that, that you're being asked to meet. And, and also so that there's a feeling that, and I'll, I'll stop after that, there's a feeling that if you, if you meet the standards, then you've achieved the purpose and the spirit of the guidelines. So that's, I think, where... Right, and, and we did, we spent a lot of time um, creating kind of a matrix comparison between the standard and the guidelines, and we found out there were a lot of loopholes. And so how could you tie back a guideline more specifically to a standard requirements so that when you came in front of the DLC, we had, you know, we had something that we could um, really found our kind of resolutions or recommendations to the planning commission on. Um, 
because once you came in front of the DLC, it wasn't truly clear to any one of us, really, if if all of the design guidelines were under review once you came in front of us and the whole book was open and we could ask you from anything about how you're covering your sidewalks to how you're providing vegetation or whether it was an open space requirement that you were meeting that was just like, and I think from the applicant's standpoint, that's confusing and that's frustrating. Um, I would be frustrated. So, um, yeah, so that was one of the impetus to finding this way to merge and basically codify the guidelines um, to make it easier for folks like Brett who are reviewing projects and providing you know initial recommendations and, and judgment on projects and people who come in front of us and then also for the Planning Commission it's just clear to everybody can you can you give me an example of a loophole that you're talking about because I don't I'm not as familiar with the DLC work as I am Planning Commission and so I'm not as I'm not as familiar as what what it is that you are looking at, and where that would have been a conflict or a loophole. Um, gosh, we have whole sections that we decided to remove or delete sections that were relative to this idea of creating um, landmarks and gateways that were like not relevant to the city or where we felt like we would want every project to have a gateway. We removed that. There's no comparison to the. Um, currently in the code, there's nothing that says each project needs to have some type of a gateway, um, you know, mm -hmm. we wouldn't want that. So we remove sections like that or sections about vegetation and green walls. There's no indication from the, the uh, standard that you needed to have any of those given things, but yet in the guidelines it's specifically calling for things like... Is it calling for or allowing for? Allowing for. Okay. Al allowing for. Right, allowing for. Well, so, whereas guidelines, guidelines are guidelines. Yeah, encouraging. If right. I mean, like part of the frustration, I think, was that you have this nice separate downtown design guidelines booklet that doesn't have a connection. Every Not every guideline had a connection to some standard in the code. So I might meet all the standards in the code, and, and never address some of the things that are in the guidelines. I mean, the guidelines include sections on signs, and we do have a sign code for downtown, but there, it wasn't even clear if the regulations for downtown signs really matched or connected well with the guidelines that were in this other document. And the same I mean, thing... If you meet the standards, you don't need the guidelines. Yeah, right? but the question was, <laughs> as a city, you've said you want certain things in this guidelines document. Are you getting them when in no one standards. has to go to the guidelines? Are, are your standards taking care of them? Well, I mean, I think that's a legit question, but I think we kind of answered that when we adopted Moving Forward Milwaukee and adopted the two-track way, you know? To right, some so. degree, yes, but I think the there's a sense that the there are parts there are limbs in the guidelines document that don't just don't have any 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 connection to to the code so yeah yeah we set up two tracks but um, there's no standard for lighting related to downtown development but we have a whole section in the guidelines about lighting so we're saying we'd like certain things about lighting but we may never talk about them if your project just meets these standards that also don't address lighting. Right. So, uh, it's, uh, just so that you know where some of how that played out, a lot of we were we were meant to create this clear and objective system that somebody, if they met all of those objectives or standards, standards didn't have to jump through hoops. They didn't have to come to meetings. They didn't. Have, they just that was done. It was a. It was yeah. A, they didn't have to come to planning commission. It was a. It was right. a straight up done project. And then, what we tried to do is create sort of a menu of possibilities. Of here are some things that you can do that we like, like green walls. Uh, that. If you're not interested in this, these are things that you can or should or would want to consider incorporating in your project to cause it to be something that we're going to approve. So that was sort of the impetus of that. I don't know that they were necessarily meant to overlap. overlap. Yeah. I think they were just meant to be 
here's how you can get your building through without any hearings, and he here are all the possibilities. And the, when I was hearing you talk, the, the little red flag that went off in my head of concern was, are we sucking out all of the possibility for really creative, interesting, unusual, non-standardized uh, no, no, not at all. Because we're, we're going to be pulling those guidelines into... So you're not doing code. it the other way. You're pulling the guidelines Right, and we're code. also trying, looking at ways to make the design standards a little more robust, similar to the multifamily. So we're also kind of taking that into consideration as well. So some things that might have been in the guidelines we think need to be in the standards. So we're kind of making that a little more robust as well as we kind of... Right. Our concern was that maybe the faucet was turned a little too far to one side where it was just we were just letting any project go through and there was no design review on important projects where there should have been maybe design review or oversight and so our interest is bringing in some of those pieces not to impend or um, it, uh, you know make it more difficult for innovation certainly not but rather to apply some of the things that are really important about the guidelines into the standard code so that every pro project, that we kind of raise the bar for every project uh, in terms of design. Is there a project that has gone through Axel without? Axel Tree. <coughs> you had, you saw an Axel Tree. Without we did. I mean, that was one of the, commission. well, that's kind of one of the projects where a lot of these conversations started is, you know, we had a whole list of things where the DLC had some concern about what was being proposed or what was initially proposed to us and then proposed the Planning Commission. And, and, and like I say, the Planning Commission may decide that a few of those things they pick up on and agree with, but um, for what it is, they really are just recommendations to the Planning Commission. Uh, they don't have to make it any formal part of their final decision. Um, and so all of that work, that discussion, the review between the design guidelines, which the city has indicated is an important piece, uh, may or may not, you know, go to the wayside, um, just based on the planning commission hearing. So, yeah. well, so Axel Tree is an example that did go to a hearing. But you also indicated you thought there were things getting decided on the clear and objective standards path so they don't go to a hearing. And I guess I'm not aware of any any downtown development that's Well, like that. one of the, the next point, I think, on the work plan is, is kind of talking about some specific sites that we're interested in, like the McFarland site, where there is no design review overlay, or the, um, it's outside of the downtown um, uh, review. So um, sites like that, which we think are, are critical sites to the city. Well, so like sites like that, if they're housing, will have to meet standards, right? If, if it's multifamily. If it's if it's multifamily family family housing. housing, right. Solely. I mean, <coughs> or no. mixed use. I'm not sure if we, I'm, I'm not sure how we'd apply the multifamily design standards to, to a mixed use, use project. Pro project. That's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah. Well, that would be a gap we would definitely yeah. need to fix. Uh, the gap. Murphy site is another one and the Milwaukee Marketplace. They're currently not under our jurisdiction and uh, we would certainly like that to be uh, part of our process. Well, I think there are some big questions as to whether we should, you know, I, I mean, I, maybe we want to have some design standards or some better code for them, but should they be at quite the same level as downtown? I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. should there be a more permissive standard for central Milwaukee, you know. Yeah, that was one of the concerns I had about that. I, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, just sort of big picture generally, you know, I, I like the idea of, you know, any way to, one of the, so backing up, um, to sort of frame it, you know, one of the, the proposed how, you know, housing affordability strategies is to streamline processes where we can. And so if, if it, yeah, if, if, if any of your recommendations are geared you know, toward that goal, then I'm really supportive of that. It sounds like, you know, some of these are, and a lot of the things that you're talking about definitely, you know, that's, that's sort of the motivation behind them. But on, you know, on requiring some additional 
you know, if, if it's requiring, an, you know, another step, then, I, you know, I'm not sure I'm quite there. I'm a little worried about that because, and then also with, especially on, you know, these sites where we've got some real opportunity for, um, you know, some, some major, major, and, you know, bringing in a lot more units at more affordable um, prices, <clears throat> I worry a little bit about applying standards, you know, that we have in the downtown and, and to a site like that where, um, you know, maybe the, the goal should be a little different. Um, so I, I asked all that to come up to the table since those are sites that are <laughs> And I would agree with you, Council Falconer, um, that any added process adds time and money to sites that have been sitting vacant for decades. Um, and even in such a hot economy, we haven't yet quite seen that leap to add another layer um, um, in terms of design standards to sites that already hire architects to develop it for them uh, and have to go through a community process if they're seeking a variance or any type of um, exception to the current standards under the zoning code then they're already going through a fairly arduous process with the community toward the development of that site. So just want to reinforce yeah, that. And I don't know said. if that was the intent, because it, it, it didn't seem that way, but I just wanted to flag that as a concern to me, that if, if, that is, if, that's, what, if that's the impact, if that's what happens, then I, you know, I'm a little, then I am weary about, you know, I'm weary about that. But if the intent is to streamline it, and we're talking about, and, and but also not prevent de you know, development on those really important sites from happening, then yeah, let's let's come up with some standards for those sites that make sense for those sites, and that, that do streamline the process and make it easier for, for someone to come in and, you know, make something like that pencil. So that, that, is, a, that is a question that I'm not, apparently nobody can answer tonight is in a mixed use project outside of the downtown are there any standards the zoning standards themselves well, zoning have standards, parameters but, uh, of any any kind of design standards whatsoever well they have setback requirements yeah. similar to what we have downtown we have um, height limitations far coverage Massive. Yeah. Um, our, so our residential design standards have things like, you know, requiring so much eyes on the street, requiring so mm -hmm. much articulation, requiring, you know, proper setbacks, street uh, mm -hmm. overhangs and, you know, walk pedestrian. Yeah. So there's like a menu that you can pick from, right? Mm -hmm. um, does that, I mean, I guess I've assumed that applies to a mixed-use building, but if it doesn't, then that does seem to me something that we need to... And not all the sites need to, um, they don't have to be mixed use. There's an overlay, an industrial overlay on the Murphy site. So if you have a user that may not want to do mixed use, would they still be bound to these, you know, additional steps? Well, they would steps? be then bound to the multifamily standards. Not if they're building an industrial, right? Because it has an industrial overlay. Right. Oh, right. Flex right. industrial overlay. Right, yeah. So that application would not necessarily yeah. apply. Right. Would so. right. But it does seem likely that McFarland is most likely to be housing. And right, and it's not be. required that it be mixed use. It's no, um, right. it could be all single fam all multifamily, no no but commercial then it be activity. To the multifamily design standards. Good food for that. Yeah. <clears throat> I think there's a, a, a process here where we should maybe inform the city council what kind of more of the specifics of what we're doing so that um, no, I don't want anybody to be caught off guard and what we've been doing for the last year and a half finally hits your desk and you're like, well, wait a minute. Yeah. Um, because, because it has taken a long time, a lot of discussion, and I think it's all um, good work and it's involved um, so, you know, consultants to help us get there too. So, um, I, I want you to be educated, you know, and informed, and ask questions along the way. If there's a process for that, that would be a work session or a study session. Yeah, I think that it's. So I need to. There's a couple of pieces in this one. Lauren has told me all this, so <laughs> I have to disclose that, and I really appreciate the conversations that she and I have had as we've been trying to figure out how to better streamline this, but also create a quality product. What I've heard come from the staff and from her have been a desire to make Milwaukee special. 
and to make sure we're not just getting handed things that people think we should have. Instead, we're getting the things we should think we should have. And I think there's a mutual interest in that. And I really appreciate that that's where she's been coming from with a lot of time and effort. Um, I don't have the history that a couple of the council members have on how we got to this point with the DLC. Uh, and I don't even think you have as much history as you would like. So what I'd really like to do is I'd like to start by just bringing, we'll go through the staff reports. We'll find out the history. I'll do a little recognizance with a couple of the old commissioner or council members who were here when we made the transition. It's going to take me a little time, yeah. Uh, but I'd like to start there. Uh, and then I would like to have maybe a meeting with Alma and I sitting down with Lauren and a couple of you just to have a discussion about yeah. what are you trying to get to, especially with the Central <coughs> Milwaukee piece, just to make sure that we're thinking about this from your perspective. Because I'm still a little unclear what, what your goal is in the Central Milwaukee piece. I want to make sure that we fully understand that and then setting up a study session. So it's going to take me some time to get through all those steps, but I think we can initiate them pretty quickly. So sometime in December, we'll start down that path if that works for everyone. Okay. Yeah. And I would suggest talking to Carlotta Collette. Yeah. She will probably have a recollection of that. She would have been on council then. Yeah, I think that Greg Shamoff has some knowledge too, because I remember he talked to me one time about the DLC and its past. Well, and there, the former path doesn't have to be the new path, right? No, no, no. So there's also this discussion yeah. of there's a way to learn from the history and right. figure out where we want to mm -hmm. go. Exactly. Um, so I think that we all need to just better understand that, too. So we'll make sure that when we collect this information, we share it back so that we don't recreate a problem that the city had in the past. Okay. Does that work? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you for sharing that, Anne, about recognizing the... the the neutral goal of making Milwaukee a special place. Absolutely. I I also want to echo that, and I'm, I'm a bit of an outsider on this committee. Are we officially committee? We're officially <laughs> committee. <laughs> um, this committee has a, a, a talented team, very passionate people who are highly educated yeah. in the subject. So I think it's important that the City Council, the Planning Commission, and the DLC are all on the same foot in terms of approaching these projects, because we're also trying to look through the lens of what's best from the sustainable, likable, livable housing affordability. Mm -hmm. And knowing that we are able to do that on both feet, I think will give Milwaukee that fighting chance. Yeah. It's, to me, it's the same with the tree discussion we had earlier. We want the best that we can get. But that's going to conflict with housing at times because I'm, I echo what uh, Councilor Falconer said, is that uh, housing is our number one goal and I don't want to create too many barriers that don't get people in homes. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I want Milwaukee to be special yeah. and I want to have a great canopy of trees. So there's, it's a, it's a, well, and actually, it's a really fun moment, right? These are discussions we've been having for several years now and they are coming to a head we're going to have to have these really hard conversations over the course of the next year because they are in conflict. But they don't have to be 100% conflict. Mm -hmm. It's about creating a process that allows for both to exist as much as they can and we're not know what the priorities are so that we don't waste a bunch of time hitting our heads against the wall when it's not actually getting us to the goal that's desired. But thank you for all your time and putting those uh, with those guidelines and standards and trying to figure out the best way to make those work for everyone. I know that you guys have put a ton of work into those. Yeah. But uh, and I'm actually really interested in, in seeing it not from a fear standpoint, but from an excitement standpoint of what you guys have have come up with. Um, me personally, when we did the moving forward Milwaukee thing, and we had that. Uh, easy the, the, the clear and objective clear and objective path I was like oh my god I hope nobody ever builds this building it's <laughs> really boring and so I'm actually kind of excited about what you're up to so hopefully we can find that sweet spot between the dynamic of all the all the things that we're having to think about right how do we cause housing to be more affordable how do we cause uh, people to build it equitably get into housing? How do we make it more sustainable? And how do we make Milwaukee special and beautiful and livable? Those are a lot of dynamics that 
sort of are in opposition naturally, but I think that's what creative people thrive on. Yeah, this isn't going to be perfect, and I want to make sure it's really clear. <coughs> yes, it will. We're no. doing perfect. We're doing nothing but perfect. There are ways that I can make anything happen, but on this one, I know that we're going to run into conflicts. There are going to be some things that we simply, one side will lose, but we're going to figure out the ones that at least most naturally meet council's goals as the priority and step back from there. So we're going to keep talking. And I also want to just before we end this, Lauren has been a huge help on the great building discussion. I wanted to call that out publicly. That she has been wonderful to work with and we really appreciated it. Got it. Well, we're going to keep talking. We need to meet again. I know, we do. <laughs> there was one other thing I had a question about if before we go, if that's okay. The, the Your parking lot item of historic preservation, I just had a question about just sort of talk to that. maybe just sort of let us know a little bit about what you're thinking around that is is that what, what's the is there has there been any discussion about what that process is i'm sorry the which piece the parking lot item of historic preservation update the city's inventory of historic oh. resources and update the code language for historic preservation overlay zone to clarify and strengthen the city's protection for designated historic resources that has been on the lower end of the list for a very long time, okay. um, just because it, the the design guidelines revamping that has been a priority for the right. last year and a half. Okay. Um, so I would say that's still on the list, but not okay. We're paying attention to, with regards to current projects, of what is, I think, missing from like our software operation procedure of how to approach that. Okay. Mary's our expert when it comes yeah, to Yeah, we have two two uh, members, Mary and, and both Mary and Brent and Cynthia. Actually, all, all of them have a, a, a background of experience in historic uh, preservation. And I, I think the, the, the synopsis is that the list is not comprehensive enough and it needs to take another look at what it is and what sites are included or excluded. Um, well, we have a, yeah, we have a house up for sale now that is very worrisome the, about what might happen to it. Well, and, well and my right, question right. is about, you know, who updates the list? I mean, obviously, you know, you know, I, I, I don't think the list has been revisited since the 80s. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So yeah. then the list is based on, on, you know. And the list was voluntary. People had to agree to be on the list. Well, and they should. Yeah. I mean, I don't believe necessarily that the city should be designated designating people's property that then all of a sudden I mean that there should be a process for getting on a list and actually designating a landmark before we we yeah so that's that's kind Compose of where a bunch I, of things on it so obviously that's not a conversation that you all are having right now but I, no. it's a much bigger conversation I think well, well it's definitely you know was part of that first phase of the comp plan was you know identifying how deficient our, <laughs> our code is on that well, the, the other interesting thing to me about when we start talking about historic preservation, and then I believe it was state code that we ran smack into with the high school. There were people that wanted to preserve some aspect of the high school or, or somehow, you know, protect the beautiful architecture that was. And there basically was no, all we could do is slow it down by two months or every Well, all our code does. Is is required demolition review? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There's it's, really we don't. Have there is to. no in code right now. There is no protection. Mm -hmm. Protection. Right. We can make it really a pain in the tail for somebody to you know put solar panels on their historic house, but we can't keep them from tearing it down. Yeah, I mean, all of this is like coming to head where it's like we just got so much energy and development and so many new applicants that we know are going to come down the pike and these things are really important yeah. if there was just only enough time and you know motivation and interest and passion to get it all done at the same time I wish there was but it's not come to the top of the list yet and at one point we're going to kick ourselves because of that project or that building or that home fell off the list and right. so and yeah, and like the, um, you know, like I said, the list is from the 80s, and so now there are all these sort of mid-century homes yes. that should probably yeah. be, be, we should probably be having a community discussion about and, Absolutely. and reaching out to and, 
Well, yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, most buildings are considered potentially eligible when you look at the state and the national register if they're 50 years 50 old. Years old right. So we've got a lot of buildings now that are 50 years old that we haven't looked at. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Where's Justin? He hasn't come here. Yeah. Oh, good point. Case in point, we want to be at the PC meeting right now oh, talking okay. about your city hall. Well, thank you. Uh, thank, you thank, thank you for the great you. work you're doing. Thank you for for taking on this uh, task that you've taken on. And I think your proposition around uh, being a commission is, is an intriguing one. I think there's potentially opportunity there as well as difficulty there. Yep. Um, so it's it'll be a longer discussion, obviously. You got it. Thank you for Thank you. Thank all you. your work. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make sure it's getting out to everybody. Have you guys seen the code? Yeah. Thank you. And you are all in trouble, too. I know. Thank you. I thought it was great. Let's do it. <laughs> the TV now. Uh, are we off the TV now? We're still Perfect. We're not broadcasting. We're, no. But we're recording. Okay. Uh, can we take a five, ten? Oh, I was just going to ask. Five minute break. Thank you. Five minute break. Yeah. All right, we're back. Are we on? Okay. Cool. So we are going to talk about the Meek Street Meek Street Infrastructure Financing for housing. Yes, we're done. Okay. Alma Flores, Community Development Director. Joining me is Layla Aman for Moral Support. <laughs> <laughs> and bad luck. Um, so, <clears throat> we all tease her. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about a, uh, this Meek Street infrastructure um, financing option for the McFarland and Murphy site, uh, specifically for the Phase 2 element of the Capital Improvement Plan, as it's written in the staff report. But I did want to just step back and, and quickly say um, there are four key ingredients to development. Land, labor, infrastructure, and capital. We are, for the most part, mainly responsible for the infrastructure. We have had these two opportunity sites, and I, I you know, have the opportunity site map as part of the packet. Just to showcase, we have been trying to market those sites ever since I've been here and prior to moving forward, Milwaukee's goal was to bring to light the need for development ready sites. And these were our sites. There are no two sites like these that are seven acres, give or take a few, um, in the entire region. We have them here in our city, in a landlocked city where land is not growing at the seams, right? So we have an opportunity to um, bring in the infrastructure that's needed for that development to happen. We have it with us today. And that is through looking at alternatives for financing because this was so important, especially after you voted uh, to adopt the housing affordability strategy and we need to have these sites become more development ready or what is typically called shovel ready, ready for that development to happen and hit the ground. Um, phase two of the Meek Street pipe replacement project is scheduled in the capital improvement plan for 2022, while phase one would be happening 2019. That's two project management time times that would be allotted to that. That is two contractors that would we would need to go through. We're asking, um, and this has been in consultation, and this has been a great team and collaborative um, setting with Public Works, with uh, the Attorney's Office, with Layla, with, um, uh, oh my gosh, uh, engineering, obviously, uh, finance, with all of the directors that touch infrastructure in some form or fashion. We all agree that seeking alternative financing for the phase two project was in our city's best interest and more specifically in the best interest of what we're trying to achieve with our housing goal. Um, so I'm here before you to get some direction on whether or not we could go after a loan from the Infrastructure Finance Authority, which is under the Business Oregon Group at the state level, um, to 
seek a low interest loan to capitalize the phase two project. Um, and as you saw from the staff report, there's a time value of money calculation uh, that we end up saving money uh, if we do the project today. Uh, and this doesn't count the staff time and those efficiencies that I mentioned earlier. Um, that's simply from a cost uh, standpoint. We actually save money if we did this project, and then we would have a shovel-ready project, or sorry, a shovel-ready uh, set of land uh, for development to occur. And so, you had, I mean, yeah, you're right. The, I'm being blunt. The, the, <laughs> the, 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 the prior planning directors, two or three back, <laughs> you know, were trying to, you know, get interest in that side. It's been a long, or both those sides, it's been a long time coming. Are there developments that have come and said that's our holdup? Yes. Really? Uh, particularly around the Murphy site and the McFarland site, both have gone through some, uh, different partners have gone through the development review process and the infrastructure, the way that it's aligned on the Murphy site, for instance, is directly down the middle of the site. Um, part of the phase one to phase two discussion would be to move where that easement lies to closer to the rail line, for instance, and then through, for the McFarland site, um, several people have expressed, the brownfields is a, a bigger issue um, from a land use perspective, but from an infrastructure, it's definitely needed, especially uh, given that there isn't that capacity there today. Um, so for we storm. have had, for stormwater, storm I, should, I should clarify, yes, for stormwater. So I would have to assume that this project is also going to affect the developability of Hillside. Phase one is already programmed. So phase one would already be part that, of And that, that reaches that We're far. I was trying to remember where the cutoff, yeah, where that. It starts from uh, Boyd Street area. to Meek, uh, and then the one okay. Meek. This would allow yes. us to upgrade the whole line. Right, at one time. And it would open up both those sites. And storm water is the, one of the main infrastructure barriers to developing those sites. This, this system simply doesn't have capacity. So you'd have to take an alternate route and then come back two years later and you're building the system that they would then... Have used in the first place. Right, so there's some inefficiencies there. Well, it makes total sense to me. Um, and I always thought the sort of time value of money thing was as profound as you're showing it in these calculations. That's why I was disappointed when we did the SAFE program that it wasn't as profound in that, given that we were talking 29 years or 20 years or whatever the range was. I thought, wow, it's going to be huge savings. And I was like, no, yeah. not really. And I was, I appreciate how it was laid out here because I think it does yeah. illustrate it. And I, I, you know, I, I think, you know, the efficiencies gained with staff managing one contract, I would have actually appreciated seeing that in here as well because, I mean, same thing, you know, over the course of four years and, and two contracts, I think that that's not an insignificant amount to include right when you're having this conversation. Uh, I think staff saw the, it was pretty clear to us as soon as we started talking about this with Alma, bringing that to our attention, which was very um, that it does save not just money but sand time, which is a different calculation but equally important right now with the sheer volume of projects we have. Um, the other thing to remember is that even that cost that we're calculating uh, presupposes that we take five years to pay this off. And we don't have to. So there's actually probably further savings mm -hmm. of paying those debts early. We did confirm that we could make a prepayment. And there are nuances as part of the um, loan itself that you don't draw down any of the interest on it until you actually take out the money to, to use. So it, even though I gave a straight amortization schedule, it's it's truly not functioning as a straight. It's more schedule. like a line of credit. More savings. Yeah. Um, there are actually significantly more savings than what I gave you in a rough calculation. Yeah, worst case conservative estimate. Yeah. Um, what are some of the, just out of curiosity, and if it's a really complicated answer, I don't necessarily need it, but I'm just curious about uh, what are some of the, you know, what are some of the restrictions on these types of, on this kind of a loan? And then obviously I'm wondering about SAFE and, you know, it, it, are, they, are they only for specific, you know, 
certain dollar amounts? Are they, do they have to be spent in a short amount of time? Like, what are some of the restrictions around? So only public entities can apply, mm -hmm. uh, and it has to be our infrastructure that we're maintaining. Mm -hmm. And is there like a online. type of infrastructure that it's limited to? Because obviously sidewalks and... Uh, you could apply for essentially everything, and, and the state actually has a one-stop resource program for all of those infrastructure needs, but in this particular case, we were only seeking the stormwater aspect, but they could provide it for other... Any, any kind of... Any type of infrastructure. That we control. That we, we control, control. yes. Okay. That we is maintain. it competitive? They have the money, and they could either go down a bond route themselves, uh, or they uh, have a pot of money that the state has um, uh, allocated. I was trying to remember what our... We actually did look at this plan when we were talking about the bonding option. Um, and there were a couple of benefits, and I'm trying to remember what they are right now. I apologize. But I think it was the sheer volume of what we were trying to construct in terms of the pots that the state makes available versus what we were trying to do in size. Well, and maybe... So it goes interest. away, potentially? I mean, you know, it's, it becomes a grant um, if you are uh, using it for a traded sector company. So it's actually an economic development tool that we're using for a non-economic development use. So it becomes a loan in that regard if we were bringing in and using it to recruit a, uh, a what's called a traded sector uh, company, then it has the option of becoming a grant. But so what if you would put it in and then because of that you secure a traded sector company? You know, a traded you know. sector company can't go on that site because it's not zoned. Not for zoned for that. <laughs> that. No. Okay. But we have the option of going after Well, we could, though. We Approximate, could on the Murphy, I mean, yes. Like, you know, yeah, I guess, yeah, on the Murphy side it could. But I'm not sure if it would be retroactive to, you know, yeah. for what you're asking for. But it could be a, a, a down the road forgivable loan if yeah. if we do recruit for a traded sector company on that. So, so it could be used for like transportation projects in the NMIA. Yes. <laughs> Can I jump in just for a second? So I worked with Business Oregon a lot on their funding programs. Two of them, the IFA, I actually didn't really tap into that as much for um, for transportation infrastructure. I worked with them a lot on immediate opportunity fund grants that were co-administered with the DOT. Those do generally have to have um, some connection to traded sector, but there's different levels of that. Um, for SAFE, the level of program that we were talking about, uh, you know, for this bond series was 21. At, when we initially started, we were talking, you know, three times that size. In my experience, even if IFA was um, more of a transportation focus, which again hasn't been my history with the program, uh, that would outstrip the IFA program pretty quickly. So we were just, I think the scale of it uh, was one where it wasn't as as desirable. It's it's there, it's a great way to partner with Business Oregon. They have they have those two programs and they have the Brownfields pot of money. Um, almost excellent at tapping into those and it's a great resource for this project. I don't know that it would have been a great fit for us for the SAFE program overall. If we're ever in a tight spot um, and we need to reach out to Business Oregon if we can find a connection, um, I'm definitely open to that. Okay. So is this, is this the same fund that we are looking for a grant on the Brownfield it's Different. the same organization, Business Oregon. Um, it's the Brownfields program, and so they offer cleanup funds, they offer um, planning grants. Um, we're leveraging the three of their grants. Looking at for the for the TriMet side. Yes, so we're we're tapping into three of those. <laughs> nice job. Huh? Yeah. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always looking for resources. <laughs> and we are looking for other possible uses for these funds in the next couple of years where we have uh, some gaps mm -hmm. on some uh, projects. But this was our first one, and it's a test run to see if it works and if, how it works, and to make sure that we get what we need out of the deal, which is housing. <clears throat> what would be the negative? That we wouldn't be able to get it tomorrow. That what? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, the negative was originally there was some concern about us taking debt from this council. We wanted to make sure that we came before you. This is us taking on a debt payment. It's relatively short term and it's relatively low interest, but we wanted to make sure that you were in alignment because it is more debt. Okay. It's literally net positive debt. It is, but it's still debt. But it's still still, still and it's still making a payment that is in a six figure digit. And not in our budget, yeah. And not in our budget. We 
have the funds coming in. But it could be a game changer for... That's the intent. I would say that most of the debt we take on, if not all of it, is a game changer. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Pay, but it's no, a very high dollar amounts by the time yeah. people let that run. So the biggest problem for the Murphy side is the uh, that pipe going right down the middle? Pretty much. I mean, there are multiple <laughs> issues. <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, but I think the infrastructure does lend itself to making it difficult for a development team to to see the investment for the investment's sake and then to add the infrastructure element and the delay and the costs associated with it and um, the unknowns. We're trying to expedite that part of the process. They've done the hard part of looking at the land, wanting to find the uh, equity partners to go in with them to do the development. Our role is within the infrastructure piece. Mm -hmm. okay. So do I have um, direction to move forward? But, and I don't know why it printed on 11 by 17. Um, the because project you didn't have any poster paper? <laughs> the, the project, <laughs> this is the project intake form that would need to be submitted to Business Oregon's um, Infrastructure Finance Authority to go through the next steps. Is everyone comfortable with that direction? I am. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Go forth and bring she us now has good luck. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, she's she's on her own up next. <laughs> oh, Luke's there to help her. That's right. Okay. I'm Do you also for moral support. <laughs> My role tonight. <laughs> Moral support. Thanks. All right, so next up we have parking code enforcement. Good evening. I'm obviously Luke Straight uh, with the police department, and uh, Layla and I have worked together on this. Uh, issue. Uh, we're here this evening to talk to you folks about a proposed budget adjustment to transition from uh, a part-time parking enforcement officer to a full-time parking enforcement officer. Uh, the city since 2011 has used a part-time parking enforcement officer working 20 hours a week to uh, meet their parking enforcement needs in downtown. Uh, currently the way that looks is we have an officer that works uh, two four-hour days and two six-hour days each week, and he varies the hours of the day and the days of the week to meet the needs of the downtown area, um, and sometimes those needs may change from week to week. Um, in September of 2018, the council, as you folks know, obviously approved uh, the resolution uh, for the parking strategy, uh, and one of the uh, key immediate or short-term implementation recommendations was to transition to this full-time parking enforcement from the part-time enforcement. Um, that parking strategy was intended to be an implementation framework that would meet the needs of the downtown as it evolves with the current development. Uh, so not only do we see an immediate need for this, but we definitely recognize that the needs downtown are going to continue to, ch to change with the development that's taking place. Um, and that, uh, that additional increased parking enforcement would be key. Um, trying to balance the needs of the downtown parking area, uh, the needs of the businesses down there. Uh, they have advocated for what they need, and they've had a chance to get to know uh, the parking enforcement program as we have it now with Officer John Simkovic and uh, he's established a relationship with the Downtown Business Alliance. We probably get more compliments on him than most. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> than anybody else we've ever had. Yeah. Yeah. We do he, and it's unique because that's primarily an enforcement position mm -hmm. but uh, those folks love him uh, and that's not necessarily typical. No. Down there <laughs> yeah, no, no. Right after tax collector, yeah. <laughs> parking code enforcement is probably. Yeah, so that's uh, no small aspect of this particular recommendation as we do recognize we currently have a person in that position that is also looking for full-time work and fits uh, the criteria for that job very uniquely. 
because he really does manage the education aspects of that position with the enforcement elements of it. And he does it in a way where he gets kind of unique community support. Uh, he really seems to, you know, in his working with Layla and with City Hall, he really seems to get what is happening down there and what we want to accomplish. And he recognizes the role that he plays in that. And I think he's interested and able to play a, a larger role there for us. Um, so, the, can I, is, can yeah. I add something? Yeah. So the reason we're here tonight is because this was the only policy item that we had not discussed going into the budget meeting uh, for a budget adjustment. Everything else either we had talked about during the budget cycle or we had talked about since. We wanted to make sure that if you had any policy concerns with this before we went to budget committee that we had a discussion. Uh, it is a part of the, the plan, of our parking plan, and that is becoming more and more critical. We have received our first uh, request for a parking, a residential parking program in the vicinity. We think that this is a critical part for us being able to start that process and making sure that all of these pieces are going to play together, that we actually have the system functioning together instead of having independent and disparate decisions being made that, that create conflicts. So as um, Captain Strait said, we have a great find right now in an employee that makes this easy. But even beyond that, I think that Layla needs some help in starting this plan, um, really implementing the plan that you guys started talking about last month or two months ago. So you're saying Historic Milwaukee has submitted a request for okay. all over? Or uh, no, it's Monroe area. mainly, but it's a targeted area. Um, we expect, though, that that's due to the construction that's going on. However, we're going to have more storefronts. That's going to drive a change in the dynamic downtown. And this is the moment in time to start that discussion. Mm -hmm. And so we'll... Um, I mean, I think it's great. I think you know, it's long overdue, um, even though I did get ticketed right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, in fact, I'm going to tell that story. <laughs> so I was in meeting with the city manager, and I was parked in one of those two-hour spots in front of City Hall, and I knew I hadn't been there more than an hour, and I came out, and there's a ticket on my car. I'm like, darn, I haven't been here two hours. I look, I make sure I'm not in the 15-minute spot, you know. I'm getting all ginned up to call her to tell her that she's going to have to testify for me in front of her. <laughs> I was only here an hour. And then I looked at the ticket, and it was for not having updated my plates. <laughs> Which I had, I had gotten my inspection. I had the tags. Oh, that's what they all say. <laughs> Compartment to wait till I washed my car and I had a nice clean plate to put them on, and then it had been two months, and so I paid my I paid my ticket. <laughs> I I got a parking ticket. Well, it's not with you, but uh, a few years back, in a meeting with Bill that was supposed to be a 15 minute meeting, so I parked in the two hour spot and. Three and a half hours oh, later, wow. emerged from the <laughs> meeting with wow. Bill and had a parking ticket. I would watch. <sighs> so I do think this is great. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to know, though, uh, next summer, are we going to have him work in some weekends? Are we going to go for yeah. yes. He, he uh, we discussed that, and he is. He actually brought up himself that for this to be really successful, he would still main, need to maintain somewhat of a flexible schedule where he's able to adjust his days of week and hours work during the day to adapt to what's going on at that given time in downtown. Uh, so both sides of the uh, of the spectrum were thinking of the same thing, but he brought it up on his own, cool. um, as opposed to just a set 40-hour work week where some of the needs of the downtown would not be met. You had mentioned in the report, and so I just want to make sure that it's clear that he, he currently pays for himself Yes. And we expect that if he goes full time, he will pay for himself, which I think is fantastic. And mm -hmm. I echo what uh, Councillor Beatty said. I think this is the right thing to do. <clears throat> He's doing a phenomenal job. As I don't know what he does. I haven't, I have, unlike some of the people in the council, I have <laughs> <laughs> sure. yeah, so no, for sure. But he apparently is doing something uh, magical. I'm doing it. Uh, really. So he's, he's fantastic, and I'm glad that we're moving forward on this. And 
I also want to say just again that the parking study was wonderful because it has data and we saw how the turnover should occur and how it's not occurring. And also the outreach that you did with the downtown and the businesses was just amazing. So I just want to again say that. I thought it was just fantastic. So I'm totally in support of this as well. Yeah. So is this an appropriate time for me to echo, to, to voice some concerns? Sure. sure. Yes, okay. I, 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 so, and this was a part of a conversation that we had about, you know, when, so if it pays for itself, it's probably it's because there's a problem. And part of our strategy is to, is to solve some of those problems, Correct. which are, and, and the strategy also calls for the additional enforcement to be coupled with changes in a lot of those stalls. And so I was surprised to see that that wasn't coupled in this request. Um, it doesn't really, I, I, I want to, I just want to be careful about, I mean, yeah. I, yes, I think that this is a good short-term strategy, but I also think changing some of those stalls is a good short-term strategy and they should 100%. be together. So the discussion I had with Layla today uh, is that we there are certain we have a lot of projects going on right now, um, and as things are going under construction, as things are moving, they're starting to partner up different than we expected. I.e., certain things are going faster, and certain things are slowing down as 130 projects play against each other. This one's speeding up. Uh, and it's speeding up for a variety of reasons, and that means that we're going to be creating a committee looking at parking both internally and externally. We're going to be doing all those things that you mentioned as being a critical component of this over the course of the next six months. Uh, it was a relatively fast shift. We thought we had more time uh, than we do, but we don't. The, the historic Milwaukee application speeds up some of that. Some of our applications that we're seeing downtown speeds some of that. We've got to start it now. And that's going to include um, changing signage. It's going to include figuring out, starting negotiations with private property owners about properties that we're going to use for the parking mix. So it's going to include figuring out how we start this full process faster than we had originally planned. I just add Please. to that. I mean, just to this is a you know one example of what we should be doing. But if you'll recall, we met um, last time and adopted this strategy. That um, there are kind of four main steps. You know, additional enforcement like that puts an immediate kind of band aid on a situation that's that's necessary. It sends a message to the public. Uh, the next is really council setting direction on our role in parking. What is our role? If you remember, Rick was talking about that as Harrison and Maine goes offline for development. We have to really think about how do we operate um, as a city. What is what is the city's role in parking management? I have some ideas about that that we can talk about. Um, and then establishing again, Anne alluded to the committee. So a, a downtown parking committee that will be made up of stakeholders and others, so that we can start to set a direction um, and collaborate. Because I think that, and I appreciate that comment, Councilor Abma, that. The collaboration is what will lead us to success, is that if we have our partners in downtown, our property owners in downtown, engage understanding the data in a way that's meaningful to them, then it helps us implement it collectively. So that's going to be really critical. Um, so those kind of formulation of, of the policy is going to be really important for us to then get to the next step, which is how do we get employees off the street? That's step one. And then step two is we start to look at the on-street system, if that's the direction that you give us to do, um, is how do we then assess that on-street system to use it more efficiently. Um, John's position is going to be essential to all of that, but for now we can at least kind of hit the ground running and we can start to address kind of the policy framework and at the same time um, we can start to develop meaningful implementation strategies, lease negotiations on sites. We're talking about it for the sites that we own or there are some creative ideas that um, I think we have about how we can try to secure some additional parking. So I appreciate the comment. Um, this is one step, um, but we are thinking about it more holistically, particularly now as the neighborhoods that are adjacent to downtown are, be, are feeling feeling impacted. We need to start to look at that as well. What's involved in the neighborhood parking application? Is it, it's for a district or a parking district of some sort. Yeah, it allows, it's a two, you have two paths. One is that I can institute it. The second is that the neighborhood can institute it. 
there has then you go through the permitting process. It's about a six month process, we believe, in order to to actually prove out that the neighborhood needs this program. Part of what we've run into is that the council adopted this right before I got here. Um, I believe two and a half years ago, maybe three. We adopted it before light rail opened, so we adopted it in the three spring of 2015. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the issue is, is at the time after we set the code, we never actually created the program. We didn't go through and create the forms. We didn't figure out all the steps because we didn't need to. Uh, we need to, and they don't exist today. So part well, of us, yeah. part of it is just having John too, is having somebody who's seen it out on the road, who's getting the trust of the businesses, who's getting the trust of the landowners, be a part of that process too. We're hopeful that that will allow us to have a better success rate. Well, and. Uh, Vera, as I recall, was the staffer on that. Yeah. And um, I do think we told, I think we made some assurances to the neighborhood that it wouldn't take six months. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, that's helpful it's to like soup to nuts. I yeah. think Anne's right. There's a 60 day determination once yeah. they file. One of the key things that we have to look at is utilization. So, if you'll recall, when Rick was here, that kind of triangle of when we should be tipping towards a residential permit program. So when they apply, that will probably be the first thing that we have to really look at is, is the utilization actually, it's 75%, I think is what our code says. Um, so we need to understand that. Um, but again, I think it's this conversation we need to have with the neighbors. I spent two hours at the NDA last night listening to them discuss parking. Um, it's a real concern to them, but how do we manage that um, expectation, but understand really what's behind it and then try to align those two things. And then the neighborhood association is the one that applies, and then creates the uh, the boundary that they wish, or how to. It doesn't have to be the neighborhood right. association. Right, it can yeah. just, it just be neighbors. Be the neighbors. Okay. Yeah, they you have, have to get. get a... There's certain percentages. So, excuse me. Yeah. Cut. Yeah, they have uh, to. It's 51 percent. So many people. On has to be a minimum, I think, of one block and 51 percent of the residents or property owners on that street have to sign it. So, I think they've initiated the process, but they haven't gone through and gotten all signatures that will be necessary. So it can be on a block by block mm -hmm. basis, um, but as Ann mentioned, we, we would actually have to develop that and then the administrative it, procedures for that. Okay. And then it sets time limits unless you you live on the... You can purchase passes for guests. There's... Right. Yeah. You get, a, you get one permit, but... I think, per house, and then you get a visitor's guest pass. A visitor, yeah. Um, it's okay. good for a year. There, I don't think it has to have time limits. <clears throat> Excuse me, it operates a lot like in Northwest uh, Portland, Portland, other areas where it's overnight parking is prohibited unless by permit. So there's certain hours of the day that you could would need to sign it. So we'd need to sign it. Um, I think we would have to determine that. I'm not entirely sure, but what that again, is. this is the first time we'll be actually doing this. Yeah. So we're gonna learn. Okay, but this is all outlined in the code, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's case by case, so there's no one like you're eight to five, and then you have to have an apartment. Okay. So. Well, does it, uh, I mean, I understand Angel's concerns on the implementing the rest of it too, but I'm still, I think that this, at least for now, mm -hmm. only makes sense to me. I don't know if anyone else has concerns. We'll keep John we, busy even when we adopt all this other stuff too. Let me. Yeah, and I mean not, this isn't a huge. This is. I mean, I, I'm. I'm. I'm but I, I'll. Yes, I'm, I'm. I will also agree with you that we should get directions to do this. But one of the things that just kind of stuck out at me was that that it would pay for itself because um, that's a really temporary situation, right? I mean, once it starts paying for itself, then you, and and you, you develop these <coughs> strategies for for better management, then. You don't have as it much shouldn't. It shouldn't, it shouldn't always pay for it itself. It should not pay for it. It, it, it yeah. shouldn't, I suspect, yeah. given the right. amount of developing okay. the development that we're going to be seeing over the next eight yeah. to ten years, yeah. it may pay for itself yeah. for a while. And yeah. paid parking, once if we go down the, the path of having paid parking, then that starts becoming a portion of it mm -hmm. because okay. you need enforcement. So yeah. it won't be the same dollars, but actually the plan is that these will be offset over the lifespan of this person through these dollars, that you're creating a better downtown and that they are bringing in revenue in order to help pay for that. Now, it's not perfect. There may be years we have to sup uh, supplement the funding. Uh, 
but I do think that just based on the, the sheer joy of our downtown businesses and the users downtown, I mean, I actually get equal number of complaints from, or pleased statements from people who should be complaining, people who should be saying, I got a ticket, but he's really courteous, he engages with people, mm -hmm. he has good conversations, he admits it when he's made a mistake, like, he's really a terrific person at this. Um, but I think he's the right person for us to do, even if we have to supplement. Yeah, and that's actually my point. I don't want to justify the position by saying it pays for itself because yeah. it shouldn't pay for itself, and it should have these other benefits that we see as a city. So I just, to me, that's just not a very good argument for a position that's necessary for lots of other reasons. And I just want to make sure that we're having this conversation in a way that doesn't suggest that, well, in two years he's not going to have a job. Well, uh, and to be fair, I would not have brought a position to you if it didn't pay for itself right now. We're outside of a budget process, and for me, that it's really important that I'm not choosing to pay for one employee versus another department mm -hmm. on an off cycle. Um, but I made a commitment to you in the budget process that we weren't done with the parking study, mm -hmm. and then I wanted to bring this back outside of the budget process. So I'm saying this in part for my employees, but also for people who can't understand why I'm not bringing other FTE count for something that's really important to them. This was specifically called out in advance as being something we were bringing to you and that we expected that this would pay for itself. That's why we called it out that way. And one other thing, with the, with the current part-time enforcement, there's a lot of opportunity for repeat customers and regular users to know that the odds of them getting a ticket based on the days they know that he works. And if they're down there regularly, they become familiar with that. So folks gauge that into their decision of if they're going to comply with the parking regulation or violate it, which leads to a lot of frustration between repeat violators and our stakeholders downtown. And a lot of that can be eliminated with full-time enforcement where folks know, okay, if I violate it, I'm most likely going to get a ticket uh, not just on Wednesday, but on Monday or Tuesday or Thursday. Or Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you very much. Please tell him thank you again as well. Yeah. Yeah. Is it nice kid? All right. <coughs> so. We have an executive uh, order. Upon adjournment of the study session, council will meet an executive session pursuant to Oregon Revised Statute ORS 192.6602I to review and evaluate the job performance of a chief executive officer, other officers, employees, and staff. If the person whose performance is being reviewed and evaluated does not request an open hearing. That's correct. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> So, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.